Hey, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you this morning? Good. Thank you so much for making the time. I know this is a really busy time of year for you. Orientation, <laughs> students coming back, busy time oh, of yes. year. I appreciate you <laughs> finding somehow to find time to uh, talk to us this morning. Yeah, no problem. I'm really excited. Uh, this is a topic I really enjoy speaking about, and I think it's relevant, you know, for a lot of people in their situation. So happy to be here. Absolutely. I'm actually surprised we haven't had a chance to talk about Leading from the Middle yet in this series. Um, it is a, a, a leadership issue that affects a huge number of people because, as we'll talk about, um, uh, all leaders also report to other leaders. So, yes. but we, you know, we have the standard uh, opening that we'll get to just so people get to know you a little bit uh, better. So the first question is tell us about yourself and your career. How did you get to where you are professionally today? Okay. Um, <laughs> in complete in two minutes or less. That's the hard part. <laughs> it is, it is. But in total transparency, it's kind of by accident. Uh, I never thought that this is where I would end up. My undergraduate degree is in public relations and media studies. I thought for sure I would be working, you know, as a fixer, kind of like Olivia Pope, you know, but uh, that just was not the plan. So uh, once I graduated, I needed a job. And so that first job was actually at a small HBCU in East Texas, which is where I'm from at Jarvis Christian College. And so I started out as an admissions and retention officer, and I fell in love with it. It was the best experience. I love the energy of campus, uh, the students who always keep you on your toes. Yep. And uh, so I did that for a little while. And then I moved back to the Austin area and actually worked in the corporate world for about four years. But um, higher ed was my home. So I, I took the ultimate leap and took a pay cut and I went to Texas State, started back in admissions. And uh, after working there for about a year and a half, I became the coordinator of student support services, which is a TRIO program. So shout out to any of my TRIO family that is listening. And then after that, I moved on to uh, the PACE Center as an assistant director of mentoring and academic coaching later becoming the director of academic coaching and a program called CAFE, which stands for Career and Financial Education. Uh, soon after, I got the opportunity to serve as the director of student support initiatives, where I uh, supervised a few different initiatives, one for minority males, one for um, it's called the Pathway Program, which is a conditional admissions program that we have at Texas State, as well as uh, TSI, the Texas Success Initiatives Program, and working with Bobcat Promise students. And these are students who come from a low socioeconomic background. So then my natural progression now is to move here at UT. So I am still fairly new. I just started in February as the director of the University Leadership Network and uh, Student Success Initiatives. Well, we're very happy to have you at the University of Texas. The next question is, um, it's a sort of choose your own adventure. Okay. Uh, what do you suspect uh, or know bothers other people about you as a leader? Or it's a different question. What is your leadership weakness? Wow, I would say probably what irritates others, I guess, about my leadership style is that I very rarely give an immediate answer. Um, not because I don't want to. I think that feedback is very important. It's good to be available for your staff. But I usually like to do a little bit of research, try to ask a lot of different questions, try to evaluate all the different outcomes, usually before I give a yay or a nay. So I do know that that can be, you know, irritating for people. So what I've been trying to do here lately is to anticipate questions beforehand. You know, what might they be thinking? What might my team ask? And try to find out all of that information ahead of time so that when I bring something up, I already know, you know, the who, what, when, where, and why so that I can give some immediate feedback and some immediate answers. So uh, it is something that I'm working on. Um, but yeah, I know for a fact that, that it irritates uh, some people, so. 
Well, especially when it's your it's still in your first or second year. I mean, Absolutely. you have to really all these <laughs> unknown variables and different cultures. You gotta take yes. some and time. And what's the policy here? You know, right. <laughs> what right. do we do? What is the habit then? Yeah, yeah. Uh, last standard question: What does leadership mean to you? Oh gosh, I I really think that leadership is a very fluid term depending on the time and space that you're in at that moment. So for me right now, where I stand, I think that leadership really means to inspire and to influence. You know, I really try to make it my goal to make sure that. I am providing professional growth opportunities for my team. I hope to the, inspire them to think of things that maybe they haven't thought of before and then to see it uh, come to fruition. I think that is the biggest part of leadership. It's getting to that end goal um, and to give your staff you know, the grace to do that, to come up with ideas and also sometimes the grace to fail. I think a lot of leadership is saying that, you know what, hey, it's okay. It may not have worked this time, but you know, let's regroup, let's reevaluate and try it again. Uh, so it's, it's a lot of different things. Uh, I also think of course that it means to demonstrate integrity and, and compassion uh, while also sometimes making those tough decisions and owning up to whatever outcome you know, happens, whether it's good or bad. So I guess I said all of that to say again, that le leadership is fluid, but as long as you're inspiring and influencing others and reaching your goal, then you're a leader. And, and nice. that is displaying what leadership really is. Nice. Yeah. I like that. Let's start by just having you tell us about University Leadership Network. Tell, t what is it? What does it do? What's its mission? Talk to us about it. Oh, absolutely. I am loving it uh, so far. So mm -hmm. University Leadership Network is actually an incentive based uh, scholarship program for students here at UT. It runs over the course of four years, but uh, not only does it help students financially, but it really helps them to provide that solid foundation in their first year and we follow them all the way until they graduate. So we do focus on four central themes, and that includes building community, uh, developing leadership skills, obviously, uh, career readiness through what we call uh, experiential learning, and then also developing some financial literacy through financial education. So students do have a dedicated coordinator that works with them from their first year until the last. So they provide activities and events based on all of these themes. And then they're also there to offer any one-on-one -on -one support and provide resources uh, to help make sure students are successful and that they are reaching their goals. So uh, that's kind of the short and sweet of what ULN is, but, uh, and I'm gonna that's stop amazing. there because I could talk about it all day. And <laughs> yeah, I imagine what a great, great program to be able to care for students in, in such a intimate way. It really is. I'm so proud of our participants. Uh, we have some students who have recently been elected to student government, including the student nice. body president. She said I could say that uh, <laughs> for, uh, with Kiara, but we also have students that are participating in all kinds of re uh, research um, uh, research programs. So they're developing the new technology of tomorrow. Uh, we have students that are interning at Fortune 500 companies within the government. Uh, it, it's really, really an exciting place to be. I, I love our students. I, I love working with them and talking to them. It's, it's, it, it continually inspires me to help develop my leadership skills so that I can, you know, help them become the professionals that they want to be. Be a role model or leader or mentor in that exactly. way. You can see what leadership means. That's great. Well, let, right. in, in that way, what do you think, you know, students' perceptions, you've been working for students, not necessarily at the ULN, but elsewhere, what is, what is their perception of leadership typically? And is it different from practice or is it the same thing? Like, how do they, at least when they're sort of, sort of getting their feet on the ground, what's their perception of what leadership is? You know, I think it's a little bit of both, but I think what students generally perceive leadership is as management, you know, being the boss, you know, being yeah. the person to make the decisions and, you know, I tell you what to do, you do what I say, you know, you follow my command and control, right. 
Right. And I, I don't think that that's really accurate. At least that's not generally an effective <laughs> type right. Um, right. of leadership style. Well, yes, yeah, sometimes, you know, you do have to be a little bit authoritative. There, there's nothing wrong um, with that. But um, I think as they move throughout their career, they move throughout the program, they learn that you can be a leader regardless of your station. You, you don't have to have a title to display leadership qualities. You know, you can do this in class. You can do this in your student organizations, uh, within your family. Uh, if, if you're a middle child like I am, uh, you have probably learned a lot of different strategies. <laughs> Uh, yeah. for leadership that don't have to do, you know, with having a title or an assignment or a role. Again, uh, leadership really is, if you can take a vision and make it reality, that's it, th then you're a leader. So uh, it's really helping them to see that and to show that they have autonomy and that they can display uh, leadership skills regardless of what their title may say. So um, I think that's probably the biggest misconception, but we, we really try to get away from that <laughs> as they're moving yeah. throughout the program and developing those leadership skills that it takes more than just a schedule in rules and enforcing those. It, it's about that goes back to that inspiration and influence aspect of leadership. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, it's great to hear that they're learning that early because there are certainly people who have been in the workforce for many years who still sort of have that misperception about what leadership is. And of course, another thing that people sometimes don't realize or don't really think about is that leaders, as we just said, also report to other people, everyone, even if, everyone. you know, that whether it's a board or Congress or whoever it might be, oh, yes. that is something that, you know, you really need to understand as a leader too, is that you're always in some way leading from the middle. So talk to us about it, what that means to lead from the middle. Well, I think it means a lot of different things, but to put it into context, I really think it means taking on a leadership role in whatever position you are in. Uh, because like you said, no matter where you are, you're always going to report to someone. It doesn't matter your title. It doesn't matter if you're an entrepreneur. Like you said, you have to answer to someone, the IRS for sure. You know, so you have <laughs> to learn how to manage uh, these skills. And really, it's a position that I think most of us find ourselves in, where we have people who report to us and people who we report to. So I think leading from the middle is really bridging that gap between the two, um, taking the good and the bad from both, and then creating something that is new and effective and efficient, uh, I think is really what it takes to lead from the middle. I think sometimes people get a little frustrated in this area when you may have some, you know, control over the day to day, but not necessarily making the bigger decisions. And so that can be frustrating, but I also think that that's powerful because you have your foot in both worlds. You get to see, you know, the, uh, you do get to see the, de the decision makers in action and you get to see the strategies that they use and you get to see, you know, all of the, the different SWOT analysis and, you know, mm -hmm. things that maybe you haven't thought of as well. And then you can help relay that also to people who you report to and then uh, who report to you. And then the people who report to you are a lot of times kind of the boots on the ground. So they do right. see the day to day, they understand um, how to put policy into practice. And so when you are leading from the middle, you get to see both of those. And that is probably the most powerful position you can be in because yeah. you get all aspects of it. And so you learn so much from this term. So uh, for me, that's what it means is to lead from the middle, is to bridge those gap between the two and uh, to make something you know, effective and wonderful out of it. And leading from the middle also gives you the opportunity to kind of go back to what I said before is to inspire and influence both. Yeah. Um, you can use the same strategies uh, for each one, you know, and it's, it's good to really put those you know, into practice and, and see how they work and, you know, to learn different personalities and how to make it all mesh. So it, it's exciting, it, it's challenging, but it's, it's very rewarding at the same time. 
That, that's great. It, it, it's, uh, I think it's easy when you're leading from the middle to feel that you're, you're squeezed and, and stretched at the same exactly. time. And I like that reframing that it's actually a really powerful position if you think of it from a different perspective. But you talk about that influence position and that uh, somewhat special uh, position you can be in to influence. Can you give us some tips? Uh, you already touched on it a little bit, but what's the difference if any, between uh, influencing people who report to you versus influencing people to whom you report? Is there a difference? Okay. Um, I think there can be, but mostly, especially if you're finding yourself in this position for the first time, or um, it's, 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 you have new leadership or new people that you're reporting to, the most important tip that I can give people is to listen. Listen and observe, listening to what is being said, listen to what is not being said, you know, um, find out, you know, what are the values of both parties? You know, what is the end goal? What is it that both parties feel like they need to thrive and to be successful? And then you go in and you meet that need. Find out, you know, what is missing. I, I always say, you know, learn to speak, you know, their language. Uh, use the same vernacular, the same terms to help get across, you know, your point. Um, again, the, the whole influence. But if you're really listening and you're observing, then that gives you the opportunity to say, okay, this is what's missing. This is what we need. How can I find a solution? And for those of us who are leading for the middle a lot, that's really our job a lot of times is to find solutions that work uh, best for everyone. So um, that is probably the first biggest tip I can give. And with That's that, cool. I guess, goes along with building relationships. Mm -hmm. um, if you want you know, things to work for you, you have to build relationships. You have to have those connections. No one can do anything by themselves. You know? That's why we have a team. Yeah. So um, you have to be able to put yourself out there and meet new people and learn their strengths and try to put those together to create the most effective team. And sometimes that's not always, you know, in your area. Sometimes we have the tendency to work in our own silos and not necessarily reach across the aisle. But if you see something that's good and working in another area, go build that relationship because, you know, they can help you. And if you're supporting them, guess what? In turn, they're going to support you. Um, so um, if you see something like that or something that you think is inspiring, go volunteer, go learn, go, go, go mm -hmm. join it because that will help you to influence and inspire others as well. You know, you always have to be learning. You always have to be researching and um, learning new techniques. And um, I guess the last tip that I would give is uh, learn when to push and learn when to pull back. <laughs> um, timing is very, very important. So I guess yeah. it goes back to really learning your team and the people that you're working with. Um, yes, there are times you're gonna have to push and advocate for your team to leadership. And there are also times when you have to say, okay, this is what we have to do. And so you really have to learn that balance is when can I continue to push this? And when can I just go ahead and accept this and work on the things that I can change, the things that I can influence, that I do have control over to make it better for the most people, you know, as, as you possibly can. So that's good. That's great advice. And that, the second one, uh, that building relationships, I think it's often ignored. I think that some leaders if you have the sort of lone wolf mentality and building coalitions is, is critical and, you know, to actually success. But the other thing you were talking about, you know, being proactive and getting things done, but another really difficult thing that leading, when you're leading from the middle that happens is uh, saying no. And we've talked about this in yeah. uh, different episodes <laughs> of this series. It's a big issue because they don't really teach leaders how to say no, and it's incredibly important. And it's a big problem for among a lot of leaders is knowing how to say no effectively. So when you're talking about leading from the middle, do you have some advice for us? Do you have some experiences that you can share that can help people learn this critical skill? Absolutely. Uh, I think you're right. Uh, we have been very conditioned not to say no. 
Mm -hmm. um, sometimes even especially, you know, as women to be, you know, very, you know, amendable to whatever it is. That agreeable, you right? To, yes, agreeable. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, you, so I guess it's kind of like the old Nike slogan, just do it. <laughs> um, and that goes from the top to the bottom. Uh, I find generally it's, it's harder to say no when it is someone that you report to. So uh, I think you have to do it politely and respectfully, but also offer an alternative. So uh, my advice would be, so if maybe there's something that you've been asked to do, what you can say is um, currently I am working on X, Y, Z, and I really want to put all of my energy into completing that. Can we revisit this topic in two weeks or, you know, a month or yeah. whatever? Yeah. And I think that um, is understandable. But if it's something that's immediate that you need done, this is a great opportunity to help elevate someone on your team. Someone who has been looking for leadership opportunities and maybe has a strength in a certain area to say again, hey, you know, I'm really, you know, busy with this and that, you know, however, um, you know, Susan <laughs> on my team here is really great, you know, at color coding or I don't know, whatever. <laughs> and so I think this is a great opportunity to have her come in. And so you're still feeling the need, but also you're not feeling like you have to do it all by yourself. And then I think with saying no to people who report to you is to give them a reason why. You can't say no just to say no. Um, you can say, okay, no, maybe we can't do this right now. Maybe let's go back and rework or we can't do this because we don't have funding. So maybe let's look at alternatives for that. I think it's a lot easier to say no when you can give um, an alternative and it's a healthy way to do it and it still gets the job done. So that would be kind of my tips or that's things great. that I have used in the past. To yeah, say that's no. great. You, you know, there, there's the whole no is a, is a full sentence, meaning, you know, you, you don't have to justify your, yourself to, when you say, say no. There's also this sort of more practical side, you know, when you're talking to direct reports and they sort of want to understand what's exactly. happening. And, and from my project management days, one, some things that you can do is say, if we go this route, here's what's going to happen. We're going to have to spend more money and it's going to take much longer. And then people start to see, oh, well, maybe I don't want to do that. And they kind of say yeah. no for Sometimes it. Sometimes fleshing it out, asking those yeah. follow-up questions uh, definitely yeah, yeah. does help. And I agree that sometimes in your personal life, you can say no, period. And you yeah. don't have to have that. But in the professional yeah. world, that doesn't always go over as well. And you want to build those relationships. You want to connect. And you want to know that uh, you want people to know that you are bought in, that you are fully committed. It's just not something that you can truly give your 100% to at that time. And I know personally, if someone was reporting to me and they let me know they couldn't do it at 100%, then I don't really want you to do it anyway. I'd rather have someone who can focus on it and put their best foot forward. Right. There will be other opportunities. Um, that's not something you know that I, I would hold against anyone. But I think in the professional world, you do have to be you know a little bit more, more, more agreeable. You have to be a little bit, you know, um, more flexible when it comes to the no. You can still say it, but again, politely and respectfully. <laughs> yeah. So we talked about how um, you know being in the middle can be a powerful position, but you know, in reality, it's also stressful because you're being pushed and pulled and squeezed. So let's talk about in the same way that we we're talking about no and sort of setting boundaries it's also important to have some self-care um, and being an effective leader when you're from the, in the middle is demanding. So yeah. <laughs> it, it means being responsive to people around you. How do we make sure that we don't burn ourselves out when we're leading from the middle? Uh, I think there are a few things that you can do. One is definitely your time management. You have to manage your time. And within that time, you have to make time for yourself. You have to make time to focus on projects. You have to make time for your family or to do something that is just for you. I think time management is really the key to eliminating a lot of stress. Now, of course, things are gonna come up. That, that's just the nature of the beast and, and there's no way to avoid that. 
However, if you've uh, properly planned for things and managed that, then you can fit those little things in. And you know, you're not going crazy all of the time, maybe just in a crisis. <laughs> uh, but also I think that, um, again, going back to saying no, you, you have to do that as well for your own mental health. And also, and this isn't, isn't always a popular opinion, but you know what, take some time off. Yeah. Take a vacation day on days that you don't have to do anything else. And um, I'm guilty of this myself. So <laughs> I'm preaching to myself as well. Most of the time when we take a day off, it's because we have doctor's appointments or we have errands to run or we have this and that to do. But every now and then, take a day just to sleep in. Yeah, and don't help. feel guilty about that. That's what vacation days are for. So yeah. utilize those, take that time to recharge. You know, it's like, it's like on the plane, you know, you have to put on your uh, oxygen mask first. So take care of yourself so that you can be the best for your team, so that you can be the best for your students. And I get it, we're all busy, but work is always gonna be there. It's never completely done. I don't think there's ever been a day that I've walked home, went home and like, you know what, it's done. It's not going to happen. No. So just take a day. It's okay. Yeah. It's okay. That's great. That's <laughs> great. But that's wonderful advice. Thank you. Let's close it out. Uh, the first one of the three here. Tell us what you're reading right now. If you have a book that you'd like to recommend in particular, um, or this is something that we're it's a very popular part of the series. Oh, no, I really, uh, I actually love to read completely fiction because it's part of my self-care. Um, so I actually just started a, a trilogy, uh, uh, the Broken Earth trilogy. I don't know if you've heard of it. I'm very much into so. kind of sci-fi apocalyptic kind uh -huh. of books. And this is what, you know, this is. Um, so the first book is called uh, The Fifth Season. And so everyone kind of lives in this post-apocalyptic earth and they go through these different seasons, but it's not just like, you know, a hurricane season or a tornado season. It's like these really apocalyptic events, you know, right, right. that go on. And so they have to come back and rebuild, but it's, it, it's very interesting. So I'm still in the first book, but I'm really excited to get I love it. It, it. It's my so, self-care kind of thing. Uh -huh. So um, check it out. It's by um, N.K. Jemison. It's, it's uh, by an African-American author and it's sci-fi. So it's, it's the nerd in me, but uh, <laughs> if, if that's the nerd in you as well, check it out. <laughs> That's great. Love it. And, and I should say that um, we do have a library on bookshop.org and we'll add uh, April's book to this list so <laughs> folks in the chat can see, can find that book there. Um, great recommendation, thanks. Uh, so what, second question, what was the hardest thing you've had to do as a leader? Wow. Um, <laughs> Say probably the hardest thing I've had to do is really just learning to adjust to everyone on your team, learning to adjust to everyone as an individual, because different people need different things. Some people need, you know, very clear structure instructions. Some people, you know, need the flexibility, you know, also adjusting to, you know, people who you report to and what their expectations are. So I would say that's probably the hardest thing because it does take time to do that. Yeah. But in the end, I think it's worth it because if you take that time, then, you know, you get, you definitely get the most um, out of it. And um, yeah, I would say that's, that's probably. That's good. Yeah. Especially it. when yeah. it's sort of crisis mode and things have to move, move fast. Your inclination yeah. is to, to not take the time, but it pays off. And this end. whole past right. year has been crisis mode, right? Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. yeah. We're still in absolutely. it. Absolutely. <laughs> Last question. Give us two key pieces of leadership advice. Okay, my first piece of advice is always know that it's okay not to have all the answers. <laughs> That's perfectly fine. That's why you have a team. Uh, I really like to recruit team members who know something about an area that I am not as skilled in uh, so that we can come together. So, um, that's one. No, you don't. You don't have to know all the answers. You can figure it out together, um, yeah. and, and that that's the great thing about it. And then the final thing is just don't be afraid to take a risk. You know, give yourself that grace sometimes to fail. Sometimes it works out and it's great and it's wonderful. And you know what? Sometimes it doesn't, but that's okay. You can just admit that. Hey, maybe I didn't think that through. 
and again, come back, regroup, reevaluate, try it again. <laughs> it's yeah, okay. That's but how we learn. Take the risk. Exactly. That's right. Take the risk. April, thank you so much. As I say, I know this is a really busy time of year for you. And the fact that you took the time to talk to us is just wonderful. And, and it was great to actually finally get a chance to meet you. I hope that our, our paths cross again soon. Absolutely. Thanks for asking anytime. It has absolutely been my pleasure and joy. So thank I you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. All right. You too. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.